you know, I was doing these traditional leather bindings, gold tooling, uh, onlay, that sort of thing. And then I started putting sculpture under the leather so that it became a relief surface. And some of the purists, even out here, uh, like, um, oh, um, Gehenna Press, um, I'm blanking on his name, but I'll think of it in a, in a minute. Um, he was giving a lecture at Wellesley College and I went and he said that if you put a, a sculpture on the front of a book, it stops being a book. And I stood up, I was pretty new to the whole thing. And I said, you know, if it still functions as a book, it's still a book, yeah, you know? Exactly. And it gives you the added yeah. sensation of the sculpture in your hands. Um, and also there's the history of it. Yeah. For, uh, for 1500 years, sculptures have been put on the covers of the books. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he, you know, some people uh, just have very narrow definitions, right? So if something is outside of that definition, then it's not acceptable. Well, I grew up as, you know, my parents were Lutheran in northern, in Minnesota, you know, out in the plains. And it, you couldn't get too much more restrictive in your lifestyle. So as a young man, I kind of re responded to that and decided that wasn't the way I wanted to do it. So I'm always asking questions. I'm always with an open mind. I try to keep an open mind to anything so that um, I can just play and have fun and come up with new things. People every once in a while would ask, well, how do you come up with all these new ideas? And you know what it is really, it's a leap of faith. Um, I'm not a religious person, I'm a spiritual person, but not a religious person. But I always feel like if I want to figure something out, I'll either dream about it, and often I'll come up with a solution in a dream and wake up with it the next morning, including to, I, I figured out a rope trick one time staying at a friend's house and they had this rope puzzle and I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning, I walked right up to it and did it, you know, it was kind of cool. Uh, I, I really wanted to to return even even more back maybe uh, when you were talking about uh, this uh, creative society a mix of different workshops you, oh, yeah. you you've mm -hmm. been part of uh, uh, this uh, this brought me to some maybe sad so thoughts because uh, I, I started thinking about uh, uh, how it was in in Soviet Union because uh, uh, of course there were creative collectives in Soviet Union and some of them were supported by government some of them were not supported by government and uh, were punished because of that but then that there, there really wasn't this chance to you know to to bring uh, or to welcome all the different businesses in one place and uh, create this synergy because there were no creative businesses. There were only creative, uh, uh, you know, uh, companies of people mm -hmm. uh, who were owned by government, not, not people owned sure, by sure. government, but, but, you know, organizations. And uh, that's an absolutely different approach. And, uh, and uh, we've got this sort of... Uh, uh, creative, you know, uh, places only later, not even in early 90s when the when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, but uh, I guess closer to end of 90s, uh, maybe Pavel will be able to chip in on this mm -hmm. on this matter. But uh, so you in, in this way, you had so, so great head start. And this is so, so, mm -hmm. so nice. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm a bit envious <laughs> because now, of course, uh, we and other creative people can have this opportunity if nothing changes mm -hmm. even more to, to, to the wars in Russia. But uh, so many years passed and so many chances were lost. And uh, this is just uh, yep. yeah, sad. Oh, and I, f I felt that, uh, you know, I, I realized that we were really lucky here because, uh, you know, I would look at what, um, you know, friends would tell me from Europe. And I was look at different journals and, you know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of beautiful work coming out of designer bookbinders and other groups, uh, but it was very traditional. In fact, let's see, we had uh, a young man who had just earned his, uh, oh, what was he? It was a master of machines. He worked at uh, Buchbinderei Mergemeier in Dusseldorf. And uh, he came over here for a month after he earned his master's papers and, um, you know, 
he spent most of his time at our local hardware store because he said he couldn't find that kind of resource in one place. So it was always funny. If you needed to find him, you knew where he was. But, uh, you know, he told me stories and I heard stories from other people about what work was being done. And now since he came over, you don't have to earn a master's rating from the German Guild in order to call yourself a bookbinder. But at that point, you did. You know, it's all pretty regulated. Uh, when I first came to the Valley, a couple of friends, uh, Sarah Creighton and Claudia Cohen, who were working with Gray Perot and then starting their own business, uh, went to Ascona to study with uh, Hugo Peller. And uh, they came back. And here I am, you know, I've worked in a couple of binderies. I probably at that point was set up on my own here in the built. Well, I was in the Valley, maybe not in the building yet. But uh, I said, hey, you guys want to see what I'm doing? And I was doing a leather binding and they looked at me and said, well, you can't do it that way. I'm going, you know, I look at them like, well, it works. You know, why can't I do it this way? He said, because my master told me you had to do it this way. And it's like, I realized at that moment, I hadn't had the money, money to go to Europe. I mean, there, there's a tradition there and we've got mm, a moderate tradition here in comparison for the, uh, for the old styles and for experience, but I realized I wouldn't have done well because I'm always experimenting. I'm always <laughs> trying new stuff. And, uh, you know, and that's what, when I started my own studio, I just thought I'm going to do traditional stuff, but I want to do, I want to push the envelope. I want to keep going with it and see what else is possible. Even if it, you know, it's, you know, maybe traditional structures with modern materials or integrating them somehow. I really wanted to ask you a bit more about uh, when a book is not a book and when uh -huh. something that, does, uh, that doesn't look like a book is still one. Could you okay. give some, some examples of the least book-like books that you've ever made? And mm -hmm. also, surely there, there is a certain line even for you. When is a book mm -hmm. no longer a book? Well, I'm, you know, since having that revelation that emotions are important to one's life, not just the intellect, I've been opening to the physical environment in a way that uh, um, I hadn't before. And so with this open mind, I, I've gone well beyond traditional codex form. And as I said, I get heckled uh, for it. People will say, is this a book? And I say, well, a book dealer sells it. So does that qualify? You know, for me, the question is, well, I guess the way I think about it is, um, again, breaking it down a little bit and saying, okay, what makes a book? Of course, you know, I was a philosopher and that's the first question. Someone asks you a question, you have to, well, define your terms, you know? So, uh, so what is a book? And uh, one fellow that worked with me, Mark Tomlinson, I had a big uh, lectern uh, dictionary out, was on a bench top, but he went over to it and he slammed it shut. And I mean, that, boom, that sound, he said, it has to make that sound for it to be a book. And I thought, Hmm, I must make clackers then because my books clack now. Um, but, you know, I think surface, well, let's go even, I think the thing that is so great about books is the relationship that you have to them, you know, and I'm an avid reader. I, I did stop. I ran away from words for quite a while, maybe five years after college, but I came back to it. Uh, you know, and I realized that a story can sweep you away. It can make a, con a constructed environment that sweeps you away and you're not, your body's not moving at all. You're just reading. Um, and then I, you know, looking at books that fell apart, like uh, badly made um, perfect bindings, you know, paperback bindings. Uh, people would say, well, I'm just going to toss that and uh, get another one. Well, I said, there's, that's adding to the story that you're experiencing with this book. You could be reading Jane Eyre or anything. If the book falls apart, that little bit of narrative is, that, is a denigration of the body. The body of this book is not important. Uh, it falls apart, get a new one. And so commercial books, sure, that way. But for me, I really wanted to um, integrate all the elements and so 
to find structures that could interact with the reader in a way that would really do that for a particular story was my goal. So that's what really motiv motivated me to look at these non-traditional, what I call sculptural books. But arguably they have surface, they have movement. As I said before, they have a compact form, an expanded form. They don't reveal all the information. There's an interaction, they're of a scale that you can interact with them. In fact, one of the first ones that I did was for uh, Peter Garrity's wedding. You guys uh, had Peter, I did a couple blogs with Peter recently and uh, we were we worked together at Harcourt and then we I came out here first and worked with David Robo, but then when I found and Bill Streeter, but then when I found the space here in the building, I called Peter in Boston. I said, Peter, there's a huge space here. Please come out and share it with me. It's bigger than I'll ever need it a uh, space to be. Well, 750 square feet. And at my top, I was at 3,300 square feet. Now I'm kind of peeling back from that a little bit because I don't do the big classes anymore here. Um, but um, oh, reel me back in. Where were we? Where where did that start? When is a book no longer? Oh, when a book? is a book not a book? Okay, so I avoided that question pretty well there for a short while, telling that other story. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I think. For me, a book, you know, I've seen static book sculptures don't really do much for me. If you can't interact with it with some way, I think it it loses its bookness. You know, I've seen examples of sculptural open books, you know, a book in its open form done in glass on a pedestal. It's a book. Well, I don't it's a book sculpture. I would give it that. But it's not a sculptural book. You know, it's a book sculpture. It, it borrows something from, from bookness. Uh, just the way that paintings, you know, a painting, uh, the planar surface of that painting hanging on the wall, you see, I mean, you could go back to certain paintings over and over again and see different things. If, there, if there's a lot going on on the surface, I went to the Bosch exhibit in uh, Southern Holland five years ago and was blown away by the richness of those surfaces, you know, just amazing. But you go and you look at it, you scan the whole thing and you've seen it. But with a book, it requires multiple movements and uh, interactions and uh, can take you back in. Uh, there's always more to see. Now, some paintings have that too, but a painting I don't consider a book. Uh, maybe someone would hang a book on a painting and that could be the book. But for me, you know, it just, um, if it's, if you can't interact with it, then in any way, but visual, non-tactile, tactile, tactile comes into it for me for books. So I think that's where the transition from books to art kind of shows its face. 